So why are we here today? Is everyone completely finished, 100% ready for Christmas? Got everything? Um, family? All the preparations for family? Survey a few years ago said that the number one reason in most people's minds in our country to celebrate Christmas is extended time with family. Uh, celebrating the birth of Christ came in second in that poll. Fortunately, it did come in above these choices, um, a day off, parties, other, nothing, and don't know. So it is more important than that for Christmas. So why, why are we here today? I mean, you and your family could be standing in line getting ready to watch Star Wars at the next showing, right? If we were Zoroastrians, we could combine Star Wars and worship, and we could think about how um, the similarity there is between Zoroastrian teachings and the light and the dark side of the Force. Or if we were Tao, if we kept Taoism, we could point out the very close connection and, and between light and dark forces and the yin and yang of life. If we were Stoics, we could point out how um, much the Jedi Knights uh, resemble the Stoic sages of previous days. If we were a, a hip church like Liquid Church in New Jersey, like them, our nativity scene could have Princess Leia standing in for Mary and, and um, Han Solo as Joseph and Chewbacca playing all the animals and R2-D2 being the wise men. Perhaps surprisingly, Yoda does not play Jesus in that particular one, or should I say Yoda, Jesus is not in that particular thing. We, we could... Um, we could take the theology of Star Wars, and every movie has theology. We could take that theology and compare and contrast it with our own theology, how the force is with you or the force be with you echoes the early Christian greeting of may God be with you. Or the reminder to young Luke Skywalker, remember the force will always be with you. And the similarity to the risen Jesus telling his disciples, remember I am with you always to the end of the age. We could take Obi-Wan's um, teaching that the force, quote, surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together, and compare that with Paul's imagery of one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. However, we'll hold all that for a different message. Perhaps that'll be the message delivered in a galaxy far, far away. So, so where was I? Why, why are we here today? Why are we in this room today, especially when I tell you that, that Christmas is bad news, bad news for almost every one of us sitting in this room. So are we really here to celebrate the bad news of Christmas? Let's pray about that. God, on this day, we think about the juxtaposition of good news and, and bad news, and, and we think about how your theology and Christ informs us and helps us to know who you are, how love and flesh coming to us as a vulnerable, humble, helpless baby helps us to understand you in a very different way. Help us to learn the lessons that you have for us to learn in this day, in this time, for it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, as Luke tells the story that Richard read a few moments ago, not long after Gabriel leaves, and Gabriel's the angel who comes to her and announces that she is going to bear the baby Jesus. Not long after Gabriel leaves, Mary leaves to go see her relatives, Zechariah and Elizabeth. How, how does Mary tell her parents about Gabriel's visit? Does Mary tell her parents? What's she going to say? To them, I, well, I know, Mom and Dad, what you're thinking, but this is really from God. This is really from God. What is she going to tell them? And so uh, perhaps the, the trip has already been arranged. Perhaps she is thinking as a 13 or 14-year-old, if she's going to be pregnant and bear a child in nine months, that she ought to see what that's like. Elizabeth is six months pregnant at this time, Gabriel has told her. So for whatever reason, she makes the journey, 80 miles journey, nine or ten days walking across three mountain ranges from Nazareth to Ein Karim, which is the traditional home in the Judean hills where Zechariah and Elizabeth were said to have been living. It's only about an hour from Bethlehem. And so she would not have made that trip on her own. She just wouldn't have. And so relatives, maybe friends, took her there and then made arrangements to pick her back up 
in three months. And so she is there, and before she can begin to explain why she's there, Elizabeth confirms the special nature of her baby. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord visits me? Elizabeth, in Luke's gospel, was the very first human to call Jesus Lord. And Luke says this is because of the Holy Spirit. And, and if this timetable is accurate, this happens just a couple of weeks after Gabriel's visit. So Mary gets confirmation that this really is of God just a couple of weeks after this mysterious visit of Gabriel to her. And Mary sings what we call the Magnificat, the Latin for the word magnifies. In effect, it's the third verse of a song that has been sung over 1,500 years, a, a thousand years before Mary in those very same Judean hills, 3,020 or so years ago for us, a, a mother um, facing an unexpected pregnancy named Hannah sang in words very similar to these words about the birth of her son Samuel. And then 500 years before that, the, the first verse, if you will, of that song sung by Miriam, Moses' sister at the edge of the Sea of Reeds as she celebrates and rejoices that God has rescued the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt and is leading them towards freedom and the promised land. Mary sings because God has chosen her. Mary, what's her name, from um, the hillbilly country around Nazareth to bear the divine child. And we celebrate with her. Everyone loves a rags-to-riches story, and that's the first half of the Magnificat. However, Mary's song goes on, and it's not only this rags-to-riches story, it's a riches-to-rags story. Mary sings, He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of of their hearts. Eugene Peterson in the message says he has scattered the bluffing braggarts, although apparently some of them have gotten themselves back together and are running for president. But he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, according to Mary. He's brought down the powerful from their thrones. I mean, who wouldn't like that part of the story unless, of course, you're sitting on a throne like Herod the king. He has sent the rich away empty. In the last presidential cycle, we talked about the 1% and the 2%. Well, compared to the rest of the world, we're a part of the 1% or 2%, richer than 98 or 99% of the human race can even imagine. And so when Mary sings that the rich are going to be sent empty away, she's singing about us, isn't she? So that's why I say that Christmas is really bad news, because not only is it rags to riches, it's riches to rags. So are we here to celebrate the bad news of Christmas? William McElvaney says that the good news of Jesus Christ, the, the honest to God gospel, the real thing is always heard as bad news first before it is experienced as good news ultimately. Good news is bad news is good news. The good news of Christmas is that God loves us enough to meet us wherever we are comes to us and rescues us from the bottom up and from the inside out. What we hear is bad news is that God is not um, pleased with that. God wants us to move on. God loves us enough to meet us wherever we are. God loves us too much to leave us there. And so that calls for change. That calls for us to change how we live in our lives. The good news of Christmas is heard as, as bad news because God is turning our world upside down and most of us are on top of the world, not underneath the world, to use that metaphor. It's only ultimately that God's people hear that as good news because the same Holy Spirit hovering over Mary's womb, bringing forth Jesus, is hovering over us and in us and, and among us individually and collectively, enabling us to bring forth Christ-like actions through the Holy Spirit, those actions which help us become more and more like Christ. Because our relationship to God changes through our faith in Jesus Christ, our lives necessarily must change. That's why the good news sounds like bad news before it actually is experienced as good news. The moral revolution of God in bringing the proud down continues in us as we live the implications of God coming to us as a baby and what that does to much of our theology about who God is and how God works in life. And the social revolution of bringing down the powerful and lifting up the lowly continues as we live the implications of a God who enters the human story at the lowest level possible, which in ancient Israel was a 
boy born out of wedlock. God comes to us not at the highest, God comes to us at the lowest. And because of that, all of that energy and time and money we spend on rank and privilege and who's in and who's out and who's up and who's down is, is rendered meaningless at best and sinful at worst because it goes against the grain of who God is revealing that we are as human beings. And the economic revolution of God filling the empty with good things and sending the rich away empty continues as we live the implications of what it means to take the resources that have been entrusted to us and use them for the benefit of more than just us, more than just our uh, immediate family. The Magnificat, if it doesn't do anything else, invites us as people of faith to change the reference point. Most of us, when we think about our lives, even lives of faith, look to those who have more than us. The Magnificat invites us to turn and start comparing ourselves to those who have less than us when we think about our faithfulness or, or lack thereof, when we think about how we are called to live in this place and in this time. Don't look up, look down, the Magnificat says. The good news of, of Christ that's heard as bad news is experienced and lived as good news when we realize that God's revolutionary act of Jesus is not turning the world upside down, it's turning it right side up so that all of God's people might come to know of the great love and that all people might come to know the great love that God has for them and for us. And that turning the world right side up um, involves those things over which we have influence and control and also those things over which we have absolutely no influence and control as well. 20 Decembers ago, 1995, Mark and Wanda, members of Kirkwood United Methodist Church, were preparing for the birth of a Christmas baby. Our son Adam was born on the 10th. And so the, of December, so the joy of getting ready to have a baby in the midst of, of Christmas, they, they invited their friends to help them um, uh, compile an, an, a um, timeline of all the things happening during the pregnancy to write letters to this newborn baby so that when he or she came into the world, they would know how much they were loved. Well, um, life is not always a Hallmark movie, and not every Christmas story ends happily ever after. And little Paige was still born 20 years ago, December 5th, 1995. And so Mark and Wanda had one more letter to write to their daughter. Our dearest Paige, it is the Christmas season a time of joy and peace, and yet a great chasm is felt in our hearts. Your dad and I wish that one day you would be able to read the words on these pages for yourself and know how much you were loved. I just came from looking in your empty cradle again and am reminded that Mary found the tomb that Jesus was placed in also empty. And because of this, there is hope, hope of holding you again and hugging you close. We have hope because of the great gift of Christmas, I understand suddenly in a way I never understood before. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary sang 20 centuries of Christmases ago. And there are lots of things we can do to respond and prepare for the gift of Christ. We can live his great commandment to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We can reorient our lives not around those who have more, but around those who have less. And, and yet, I guess we could organize our lives around myths. There will always be another Star Wars movie coming out, probably. And yet, um, there's one thing we can't do, and that is to save ourselves and the ones we love from the power of death. Only God, our Savior, can do that for us, what we cannot do for ourselves. Thursday night, Christmas Eve, we will read the Christmas story where the angels sing good news of great joy to you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The good news of Christmas, which sure sounds a lot like bad news, is ultimately the best news of all because God, our Savior, working through Christ our Savior, is determined to save us whether we live a long and prosperous life or whether we never draw a breath on this side of the womb. God is determined to save us. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. And if our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent an 
inventor. If our, if our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. And if our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent an entertainer. But our greatest need was and is salvation. And so God sent a Savior, born 2020, give or take a couple of years ago, in Bethlehem, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who saves us from the power of sin and death and empowers us through his Holy Spirit to live as his people in this time and for all time. And friends, among the distractions of this time and place, that's why we're in this room this day. That's why we're here. Merry Christmas. We give you thanks, God, for the incredible, powerful gift of salvation in Jesus to know that we and those we love are never completely lost to you and your love. We give you thanks for that and for how you empower us to be able, through the Holy Spirit, to live as your people in this place and in this time, as we share more and more of who we are with those who need more and more of who we are, simply to live day to day. We thank you for Mary's magnificent song, Rags to Riches, Riches to Rags. In that song, we discover how you are at work among us, bringing us the real, honest to God, good news, gospel of Christmas salvation. It is in the name and the spirit of Jesus that we pray. Amen.